Uh, I've just been having some really interesting conversations out there about cravings and why we feel like we need to walk over hot coals to get chocolate from time to time. It's been fascinating. So <clears throat> I, for one, have lots of questions at the end of the session, so we'll just rip into our next guest. The Australian chocolate industry is worth more than $2 billion per year. And while in moderation, chocolate can be enjoyed as part of a healthy diet, giving into cravings too often can be bad for your health and bad for your waistline and you may end up on the biggest loser at some point. And uh, loser you can take both ways. Uh, chocolate can interact with brain chemistry and research suggests that up to 97% of women and 68% of men experience cravings and not surprisingly, Chocolate is the number one craving. We're talking now to a woman who's really, really interesting. I had her on my radio show the other day. She is a CSIRO psychologist and researcher. Her name is Dr. Robin Vast. She doesn't look old enough, does she? Look at her. She looks about, she's actually about 12. And if she tells me that eating chocolate is why she looks so young, I'm going out to buy a truckload. <laughs> she's going to tell us where cravings come from and also give us useful tips in how to avoid gluttony. Please welcome Dr. Robin Vast to the podium. Oh, hang on, before we go. Uh, Hugh is our photographer, he is here now. Uh, he is obviously taking photographs for the website and for associated promotional material. If you don't want your image used or if you don't want a photograph taken of yourself, if you can kind of subtly uh, let maybe Maxine up at the back there in the purple top know and we'll make sure that Hugh avoids you. Thank you. Like it avoids you like a diet. Here we are. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for the intro. No, you look good. You look good. No, don't worry. You'll be fine. Just yet, yeah, yet, yeah, just fluff your hair. You'll be looking good. <laughs> well, we yeah. use airbrushing too here at the RIOs because it's all about science. So we'll all be looking like Miranda Kerr, won't we, Hugh? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Robin. That's <laughs> okay. Yeah, so my name is Robin Vast and I'm a researcher from CSIRO. And the main purpose behind some of the research that I've been conducting recently is about designing behavioural and psychological interventions for dealing with things like obesity um, and eating behaviours and obviously food cravings fit pretty neatly under that category. Uh, obviously there's many different reasons why we have cravings and there's also many different ways of handling cravings and trying to tackle these sorts of issues. Um, but my background as a psychologist means that I deal with um, our our thoughts and what goes on in our minds and how this might influence our behaviours. And I'm really happy to be here tonight to talk about some of the research I've been doing and also uh, a relatively new approach, a uh, different approach to dealing with food cravings, which helps us learn to, learn to um, eat the things we love in moderation. I'm going to start tonight's session by asking you a few questions, which are more like statements. There's three statements. And this is what the clicker pads are all about. So I'm going to get you to give me your opinions on food cravings and, and how you think we should handle food cravings and resist temptation. So the three statements, there's got, they're true or false. So if you think that the statement is true, then you need to just press A. If you think the statement is false, then you need to just press B. But don't respond until the 10 second countdown comes up on the, on the slide. Otherwise, your response might not be recorded by the system. So the first statement, one of the best ways to get rid of a food craving is to stop thinking about it and distract myself with something else. So if you think this is true, press A. If you think it's false, press B. So you can start now. Okay, statement two. Food cravings are controllable. I should be able to control my cravings and urges for different foods. So if you think this is true, press A. If you think that it's false, press B. Okay, and the final statement, the harder I try to get rid of my cravings and urges for food, the more likely they are to go away. So if you think this is true, hit A, false, hit B. Mm. Mm. 
Okay, now we're going to go through your answers to each of the questions in turn. I'm just going to give you a bit of a discussion. Okay, so question one. This is essentially about using techniques like distraction and avoidance to deal with our, with our food cravings. And for those 66% of you who said that uh, this was a, a good technique or one of the best techniques, then you're in line with one of the most predominant views in psychology for a very long time. These strategies can work for some things and do work for some of us some of the time, but for those 34% of you who believe this is false, um, you're also on the right track as well, and there's many reasons for that, and I'm going to go through them now. Two of the most common strategies that we use when we're trying to deal with things like food cravings and unwanted things or unpleasant things that happen in our lives, we use distraction and avoidance. So distraction, we've all done it. We try and think about something else. We try and do something else. We try and think about something more pleasant, or we try and do anything we can to try and take our mind off something that's bothering us or something that we don't want to be feeling. And we also use avoidance. So, for example, we might avoid seeing people that we think are going to pressure us to eat foods that we don't want to eat. Or we might avoid going down the chocolate aisle in the supermarket <laughs> because we don't want to have the exposure to chocolate and, and feel so tempted into eating it. But the problem with distraction is the more we try not to think about something, the more we end up thinking about it. So, for example, whatever you do, don't think about a purple elephant. For most of us, the first thing we think about is a purple elephant. We imagine it, we think of what a stupid thing that would be, or you know, we, think, we just think about it. So now whatever you do, don't think about chocolate cake. And again, the first thing that happens, we get an image of chocolate cake in our mind, or we think about how good it would be to eat chocolate cake, the last chocolate cake we had, or the best chocolate cake we've ever tasted. The problem is when we try and not think about something, we create a verbal rule, so don't think about X, whatever the X may be. But the problem is that we need to be thinking about X to know that we weren't thinking about it. <laughs> the problem with avoidance is that it's not a foolproof strategy. So this is particularly the case with food because we all have to eat, so we can't avoid food, otherwise we will die. Um, essentially, um, we, you may have been told as well that a good strategy to avoid eating chocolate is to not have it in the house. The problem is that most of us are not hermits, so eventually we're going to have to leave the house at some point. We also can't control what people bring into the house, yeah. so what people offer us if they come around. We also can't control what we're exposed to, th things like on the TV, so we can't control these things. So avoidance is not foolproof, and we can just be innocently going about our daily lives we can't guarantee that we're not going to be exposed to things like things like chocolate and foods that we like. The other problem with avoidance is that when we use this type of strategy, we can also miss out on a lot of things in life. So by avoiding certain places, certain people, doing certain things, we're not engaging in life to the fullest. So question two, and this referred to a general belief that food cravings are controllable and that we should be able to get rid of them if we want to. I'm glad that 72% of you believe that this is true. <laughs> and for some, for some things in life, this is true. We can uh, do some things that, that can lessen, lessen the, the effect of things on us, and it does work for some things in our life. But similarly to the first statement, this can actually prove false as well. Humans are naturally wired to respond to problems with what's known as a control agenda. So humans are problem-solving machines and we see everything that happens to us that's unwanted or undesirable, something that we don't like, we see it as a problem. And we see it as a problem that needs to be fixed. So we need to fix it, we need to solve it, we need to get rid of it somehow. So for example, if you're feeling a little bit nervous about an upcoming job interview, um, your mind will often tell you things like, um, don't worry about it, it's not that big of a deal your mind might tell you, you need to really start doing some preparation so that you don't stuff this up. Or your mind might tell you, just don't go. Just don't go to the interview at all. Because your mind is trying to solve the problem of your anxiety. It's trying to get rid of your anxiety for, it, for you because it's the only way it knows how to deal with problems. <coughs> so it's not surprising that when the mind operates in this way, like a problem solver, that it also operates in this way for things like food cravings. 
So when we have a food craving, the mind will tell us things like, just eat the chocolate because it will get rid of the food craving and that's what the mind wants to achieve. What the mind doesn't realise is that, first of all, not everything is a problem that needs to be solved. So food cravings fit into this cat category. They're not necessarily a problem that needs to be solved. And the second thing is that this problem-solving agenda, whilst it works for some things in our lives, it doesn't work for everything. And it works particularly poorly for things that happen inside us, so things like our internal experiences, so our thoughts and our feelings and our memories. As much as we might like to be able to, we can't control our memories. We can't delete our memories. And we also can't control our feelings as much as we would like to be able to. So imagine, for example, that I've got you all hooked up to an anxiety detector machine. And the machine has hold of your feet and it's dangling you upside down from a 20-storey building. <laughs> now, all you have to do is not feel even the slightest little bit of anxiety. <laughs> Otherwise, the machine will let go of you and you'll fall to your death. It's quite an extreme example, but it just demonstrates that even when our life depends on it, most of us just couldn't control our feelings like this. And it's in a similar way, we also can't, often can't control our cravings as well. Our cravings will come and go as they choose, um, and there's not really all that much that we can do about it. If you really think about it, if we could control our internal experiences like this, none of us would have cravings. None of us would have bad memories. None of us would feel anything negative. We'd never feel sad. We'd never feel upset. We'd never feel depressed. It's just not realistic. And this leads quite nicely into question three. One of the biggest points that I wanted to make today was, was exactly this. And this is all about, about effort, how hard we try to get rid of our cravings. And traditionally, most of us, and I'm, I'm interested that most of you have said false to this question, because a lot of people tell themselves that the reason that they haven't been able to manage their weight yet, the reason that they haven't reached their weight-related goals, or the reason that they haven't been able to conquer their food cravings is because they haven't tried hard enough. They haven't put enough effort in. They haven't done the right things yet, and they just need to keep trying. And this is true for some things in life. So for things like athletes, they may be able to say, you know, I didn't beat my opponent because I didn't train hard enough. But it doesn't work the same way for things like our thoughts, our feelings, our urges, and our cravings. In fact, the harder we try, often the worse things become. And I call this the boomerang effect. So when we try and get rid of things and throw them away, um, get them out of our lives, it often increases the chances of them coming back at us, and it increases the chances of them coming back at us a lot worse than when we tried to throw them away in the first place. Imagine that there are two scales. And one scale is over here, and this is called the chocolate craving scale. And the scale goes from zero, which is no chocolate cravings at all, up to 10, which is obviously maximum chocolate cravings. And most of us focus on this chocolate craving scale. We don't like having chocolate cravings, and we're very aware of the fact that we're having chocolate cravings. But there's also another scale that not many of us actually think about or, or realise even exists. But this scale is the one that we need to be focusing our attention on. And this scale over here also goes from 0 to 10. And the scale is called willingness. And willingness essentially just means being willing to experience our experiences as they happen, without trying to change them, trying to control them, or trying to make them go away. Most of us get into a situation where our cravings are high, so our cravings are up here at a 10, and our willingness is low, so our willingness is 0. We're completely unwilling to, to experience this craving. And it can apply to all sorts of things and other emotions. For example, anxiety. Some people are very unwilling to feel un um, anxious about things. People are, can be very unwilling to feel sad about things. But this is a really bad combination. It's kind of like a ratchet. So when cravings are high and willingness is low, the ratchet's on. And the cravings can't possibly move. They're stuck. But when we increase our willingness, so the willingness scale goes up, then the ratchet turns off. And then our cravings are free to move. They may not necessarily move, but at least they're free to move. What I can almost guarantee you is that if we aren't willing to have something, then we will. Often just being willing to experience something takes the power away from it, and it starts to automatically just have, a, have less impact over us. Hmm. Okay. 
So for a very long time, psychologists have been teaching us to do these sorts of things. And you might be thinking, well, if we can't distract ourselves from food, we can't avoid foods that we're tempted to eat, and we can't sort of try and control or get rid of our cravings, it doesn't matter how hard we try, then what on earth are we supposed to do? And as I've already alluded to, one of the first steps is to raise the willingness scale. And this skill forms a part of what's commonly referred to as acceptance. And acceptance is quite simply just opening up and making room for our internal experiences. It means being willing to experience our experiences as they happen without trying to control them, change them or manipulate them in any way. It doesn't mean we have to like them and it doesn't mean that we have to want to have them. It just means we need to make room for them in our lives and accept them as part of being human or part of being us. Because we're all different and we all feel different things and it's about accepting that that's the way that we are. It sounds quite simple but it's actually quite a complex, uh, difficult thing to achieve. And it's also different to tolerance. Think about it this way, would you rather that your family tolerate you or accept you the way you are? Now this is all well and good and it sounds excellent in principle, it sounds like a simple easy approach. I don't have to fight my cravings anymore, it's not a battle anymore, all I have to do is just accept that it's happening. It sounds too good to be true, but does it really work? And that's exactly what I wanted to find out. And I've just recently conducted some research to test out this idea. I tested out a specific acceptance based approach called cognitive diffusion. And cognitive diffusion is all about creating a distance between us and our experiences or our thoughts. When we create a distance between us and our thought, our thoughts or what goes on in our minds starts to have less influence over our behaviours. The name cognitive diffusion comes because it's the opposite of fusion. So when we're fused with our thoughts, if you imagine that these are my thoughts here, when I'm fused with my thoughts, they're up here and they're right rumbling around in my mind and I can't see people, I can't engage in life, I can't do the things that I want to do in life. When I'm diffused from my thoughts, I can bring them out here. So they're out in front of me or they might be to the side of me or I might even tuck them under my arm. They're still there. I haven't tried to change them in any way but now I'm free to engage in life. I'm free, I can see you all, I can engage with you, I can achieve my goals. A very effective way of of achieving cognitive diffusion is by treating the mind like it's a separate entity. So there's me and then there's my mind. And unfortunately for most of us, about 80 to 90% of what our mind dishes out to us is negative and unhelpful. So our mind will tell us things like, go on, eat the chocolate. You may as well, what have you got to lose? Your ass is big anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've already eaten most of the block, you may as well just finish off the row. Start your diet tomorrow, you might as well just cut loose tonight. When, we do, when we're fused with our thoughts, the mind is, is in our head and it's rumbling around and, and we, can't, we have no separateness from it. So when the mind tells us things, we obey. When we're diffused from our thoughts and they're out here, we can sort of notice what the mind's saying and we can look at it and say, well, thanks mind, but that's not very helpful. And when our mind tells us stories, you know, oh, you should, you should go down to Hague's. I mean, <laughs> obviously, you should go down to Hague's. Go. <laughs> Quickly. But you can say, oh, here we go, the mind's telling me, telling me that chocolate story again. So essentially what cognitive diffusion is about is separating us from our thoughts so that we can have more perspective and so we can decide whether or not we want to listen to these thoughts. Are these thoughts helpful? Are these thoughts going to help me? Do I want to act on these thoughts? So in the research I recently conducted, I used 110 self-identified chocolate cravers. And these people were um, people who had, was, they were screened before the study to make sure they had uh, a serious problem with chocolate overconsumption. So they weren't just people who liked to have a little bit of a nibble every now and then. These were people who just couldn't stop and who had quite a serious um, eating problem and, and wanted help. Uh, we split the group into three. There was a no intervention group, so basically they were told just try your best, uh, use whatever strategies that you normally use. Then group one was given a control based intervention. So this involved trying to change our cravings, so trying to get rid of our cravings, trying to change our thoughts and replace them with thoughts that, that were not related to cravings or that lessened our cravings in some way. 
And then the third group was taught the acceptance-based approach based on cognitive diffusion. And all the participants came into CSIRO and they were given a bag of chocolates and they took the chocolates away with them and they were told to use the strategies you've been taught to try not to eat the chocolates and don't eat any other chocolate for the, for the seven-day period as well. And at the end of the seven days, they were asked to bring back their bags, what was left in their bags, uh, to see how successful they were at this task. So the results indicated that the acceptance-based approach was significantly more effective than both of the other treatment groups. Mm. And this graph displays the percentage of participants who were abstinent from chocolate throughout the seven-day period. So you can see that 43% of people who didn't receive any intervention were successfully abstinent. And this is quite a lot of people. So obviously people you know, using their normal strategies, they were still, some of them were still quite effective at achieving this task. 56% of people were successfully abstinent from chocolate in the control-based approach. So this was better than the no intervention group. Um, so there is some advantage to these types of strategies. But 81% of people who were in the acceptance-based group were successfully abstinent. So it demonstrates that, yes, these, these techniques do work. Um, the participants in the acceptance-based group also reported that the strategies were significantly easier to use than the participants in the control-based group. And that's also quite an interesting finding. I've just included as well some quotes, uh, direct quotes from some of the, the participants who were taught the acceptance-based approach. Um, a lot of them found the strategies to be quite useful and also quite relevant, not only to chocolate but to other foods and to a range of other behaviours and just living their life in general. So if, I think the results are quite promising and from my perspective um, in the future I'm, I want to follow, follow this up. Particularly I want to look at whether or not these approaches can work in the long term because this study was only over seven days. And I also want to look at whether it can help us with eating in moderation. So in this, in this study, obviously, the task was to remain abstinent from chocolate. But that's obviously not a realistic goal. And it's not a goal that we would advocate for the rest of our lives. It's all about eating food in moderation. So I want to test these ideas out. Do these approaches work long term? Mm. And do they work um, successfully? So I just want to acknowledge uh, that the information that I've presented today is based on an approach called acceptance and commitment therapy. And the information has come from a variety of sources, but I've put two books up here if any of you are interested in uh, reading further about the approach. The first book is Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life by Stephen Hayes. And Stephen Hayes is an American researcher and he heads a group of people who are doing quite a bit of research into the acceptance-based approach. And the second book is called The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris. And Russ Harris is an Australian and he... Um, teaches uh, acceptance and commitment therapy to therapists and to researchers like myself and also provides seminars to the general public. So I'm going to finish off the session today with doing a bit of an exercise with the chocolate that you've got and I'm sure you'll all be pleased to know that it involves eating the chocolate. Good. I'll get back up here because I need to eat this chocolate. I'm happy to help out when it comes to these sorts of experiments. Hey, does anyone not have the piece of chocolate? Yeah, because we've got some spares for those people. Don't lie. Can't lie. <laughs> What's the good piece? Did you get one? Did you get a chocolate? You've got a chocolate? Yeah, cool. All right. Everyone yeah, we've all got one. So everyone's got one? Okay, now this exercise might seem a bit silly, it might seem a bit stupid, but I highly recommend that you at least give it a go and hopefully you may get something out of it. If anybody's ever driven their car somewhere, got somewhere and had absolutely no recollection how they even got there, or if anybody's got to the end of a bag of M&Ms or a block of chocolate, or a packet of Tim Tams and thought, where did that all go? Then this strategy might be helpful for you. So what I want you to do is to take the chocolate and hold it in the palm of your hand. In 33 seconds, it should melt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, apparently we've only got 33 seconds before it hits melting point, according to our food scientists here. 
So hurry up, Robin. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> quickly, so hold it in the palm of your hand. And I want you to look at it carefully. Look at it as though you've never seen anything like this before in your life. You've never seen a piece of chocolate before in your life. Look at the colour of it. And look at the shape of it. And look at the surface of it. Feel the weight of it on your hand. Now hold it between your finger and thumb. And turn it over. Roll it around. Really look at it like you've never seen anything like it before. Wow, it's amazing. Notice how it feels on your fingers. Is it melting? Yes. Notice its shape and its texture. Okay, now smell the chocolate. Put it up to your nose. Mm. <laughs> mm. Now take another look at it. If you're going to say to us not to eat this, I'll hate you forever. <laughs> Seriously. Now slowly put the chocolate in your mouth. Don't chew on it. And notice how your hand and your arm know exactly where to put it in your mouth. <laughs> notice your mouth watering. Notice the movement of your tongue in anticipation. Mm. Notice the sensations in your mouth without biting the chocolate. Mm. Let it sit on your tongue. Roll it around in your mouth and notice the flavour. Mm. Is it getting softer? Is it losing its shape? <coughs> when you're ready, bite into the chocolate and notice the taste that it releases. Mm. Slowly chew the chocolate. Thanks, notice the changes in texture. And notice the movement of chocolate around your mouth. Notice it in your teeth and on your tongue and in your cheeks. You when you chocolate. feel ready to swallow it, Notice the sensation of it going down the back of, back of your throat and moving down into your stomach. Mm. Now move your tongue around your mouth and get rid of every little last bit of taste of chocolate that you can. What a shame. <laughs> and that's the end of the exercise. And some of you probably finished it long ago. But if you, <laughs> if you haven't, um, often people say that when they eat in this way that they would probably eat a lot less of the food mm. that they're eating um, and that we appreciate it more and we notice more about it. Um, so this is a good technique to avoid overconsumption because we, we appreciate, we, ne we need less to feel fulfilled. So if you I'm sure you've all heard the saying, don't forget to stop and smell the roses. Or maybe we should all start saying, don't forget to stop and smell the chocolate. That's the end of my presentation, so thank you.